I'm going to be talking about applications now, so uh, no more equations. <laughs> um, so the first thing I'll talk about is comparing Kingman's coalition to alternatives. Uh, during the break, there were some very good questions. Uh, one of them was, how do, you, how do you know if you're doing well? Because this is something unsupervised. Um, typically, we don't have ground truth labels for like, gr ground truth trees, right? So even if there is a clustering data set, typically we don't have a whole hierarchical clustering labeling. We only have pl flat labels. Um, so the way we can evaluate how well we are doing is basically looking at how well we are clustering the flat labels uh, compared to other algorithms and see if we are doing better flat clustering than other algorithms. I mean, this is a pity that we, we cannot actually do the full hierarchical comparison, um, but this is at least one step uh, in, in evaluating how well the coalescence does compared to other algorithms. So this is the average linkage. It's uh, the algorithm that I mentioned earlier, the classical linkage algorithm. This is Bayesian hierarchical clustering, uh, which was done by Zubin here and Catherine Heller. Um, and this is the coalescence. So these results are by these guys uh, using, um, using their uh, NIPS paper results, basically. I think it was NIPS 2008, if you want to look at it. So comparing these in terms of purity, subtree, and uh, Lee one up accuracy. So purity is uh, when you look at the trees, that are constructed, the subtrees that are constructed, uh, what, uh, what percentage of these subtrees are pure, which means uh, what percentage of them have uh, data points that are only belonging to one particular flat clustering label. Okay, so uh, here you can see that uh, Collison did better in this score uh, for, for the MNIST data set, the 110 digits data set. Subtree, is um, when, when you pick a random point, a random leaf at the tree, and another random leaf at the tree, and you join them together the, the, from the same cluster, right? When, when you join them together, uh, the tree, the subtree that is required to join these trees together um, is basically measured in terms of its purity, and this is uh, the probability of the points in the same cluster belonging to the same pure subtree. So again, coalescent did better for this data set uh, on, on this score. And leave one out accuracy is basically, uh, you leave one data point out, you learn the trees, and then you decide where to put the next tree, uh, ne next data point, and uh, that, that's the accuracy of the clustering, again, a flat clustering performance. So again, same uh, performance scores for the same algorithms on a different data set. Here, the Bayesian hierarchical clustering did better in terms of purity, uh, and coalescent did better in terms of subtree and leave one out accuracy. And uh, on, on another data set, this is the languages data on the Indo-European subpopulation and the whole world languages. Uh, you can see that Collison did better in this subtree and um, average linkage did uh, better on subtree score on the whole world population. So, so, what, what was the task? Like, so, the task is uh, you, you, you are given a binary representation of world languages. So, basically, these are uh, properties of the world languages def um, defining what the language is. I don't remember the size of the uh, feature vector. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember the size, but I know that it is binarized, and the task is to learn a hierarchical clustering structure for given these features, okay? And then, um, there was a da missing data completion task. Uh, again, coalescent was compared to nearest neighbors, the agglomerative clustering or the classical linkage and probabilistic PCA. 
and you can see that uh, on average it, it does better than the alternative algorithm. And this is also from that language of data. You can see the clustering that it gets, the coalescence gets. Uh, it, it can cluster the, the languages into reasonable uh, clusters. So again, to reemphasize, this is totally unsupervised. So uh, you only give the feature vectors, you give the set, sorry, settings of the, pri um, the hyperparameter, in this case, which is only one hyperparameter, which is the mutation rate, and then it finds the clustering of the mutations. Um, so these are not map estimates. These are uh, samples from yeah, the assent. Sorry, I can say this about you. Is, is it just is it a sample with a bias like I can get? Um, so these are not I okay. I, I so there is no burning in this case because it's sequential Monte Carlo. Um, so. In, in, Monte in sequential Monte Carlo, there is no concept of burn-in. You, you have independent samples, basically. Um, and this is, well, in, in sequential importance sampling, you have independent samples. When you have resampling, then you do have some correlation between the uh, particles. Uh, and th these two are from sequential Monte, se sequential important sampling, and this is from sequential Monte Carlo. Uh, here, oh, okay, H here are the weights. <coughs> so these are the weights for, for the particles that were used. I think there were like, I don't remember exactly, but I think there was on the order of 100 particles uh, used for these experiments. Um, so this particle has a huge weight, I, I'm not sure if you can read it, it's 0.998921. And this particle has a tiny weight, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.000073, and so on. Um, I'm showing these two, the, the, this is from, the, from one simulation, right? I'm showing these two just to emphasize that if you do, do not do resampling, then one weight may have all the, all the glory, right? whereas uh, all the other weights can be tiny. But then the interesting point here is, although this has a tiny weight, the clustering structure is not that bad after all, okay? So you could probably do better by doing resampling. This is with resampling. Uh, so you could probably do better than this with resampling. Uh, but even if you don't do resampling, what the samples with tiny weights that you get are not all that ridiculous. Um, so the simplest way of resampling is basically you, you, have, you have the weights. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you have, you have some weights, right? These are, let's say, weights of your samples. And then some, some tiny ones, like, right? So uh, you, have, you have your weights that sum to one. So this is like a multinomial distribution. So what you, and there is a particle associated with each, with each of these weights. Let's say these are values of your uh, theta parameters. So there is a theta one here, theta two here, theta three, theta four, theta five, and so on, right? So what you do is you sample from this multinomial distribution uh, with re replacement as many times as you have number of particles. Let's say you have m particles, you sample m times with replacement from this distribution. So let's say you sampled uh, this guy five times, this guy 20 times, and this guy 19 times, and so on, right? So in the end, what will happen is you're going to have only some of these samples chosen, and all these samples with tiny weights are going to be not chosen. Um, so then let's say you had, originally you had m weights, uh, m particles. You still have m particles, 
But this time, because you did resampling, what you do is you set the weights of the resampling to um, basically one over m, or sorry, one over the number of things that were chosen, let's say k. There were k unique particles that were chosen, so you set the weight of everyone to that equal value that will sum up to one. The, the, this is the, in, uh, for different experiments I use different values, but I think this was with n equals 100. Um, and for the later experiments, I'm going to show different um, m values. Okay, and I'm not sure, so I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think these results uh, by at all were done using their greedy algorithm, not the SMC algorithm. Okay, learning visual taxonomy. So this is a fun task uh, of learning taxonomies of images from birds. So there, there are these images that were collected from Flickr. Uh, there are 200 bird categories, um, and there are in total 6,000 6, something images. So what we want to do is we, we get the mechanical Turk annotations of I images uh, together with their confidence level, which means uh, shown every image, the mechanical Turk user uh, tells what color is the beak, what color is the wing, what color is the belly, and so on, and how sure he is about that annotation. And uh, we want to learn a visual taxonomy of bird categories and there are multiple things that we can use the taxonomy for. For example, test search through the data, summarize and visualize the data, learn su super categories, learn sh shared features around categories, and so on. Uh, so a bit more detail about how the data was collected. Um, so I, each mechanical Turk user is shown an image of the bird and a caricature of the bird with the high, uh, with um, the particular part highlighted, the part in question. And there's the question here, wh what is the shape of the bill or beak? And they say, select one, if the beak isn't visible, make your best guess, then select guessing. So there, there are three things that they can press, guessing, probably, definitely, okay? So uh, given, given this image, what's the <coughs> shape of the beak? And uh, the data was binarized. Uh, by saying, rather than asking multinomial questions like what is the shape of the beak? Uh, is the bill cone shaped, yes or no? Is the bill, uh, bill needle shaped, yes or no? And with confidence level. The reason why it was binarized because they were doing some other experiments and I, was, I wanted to use their uh, exact same type of data that they used basically for comparison. Another thing, so th you can see that um, there are multiple possible attributes, and the number of possible attributes change uh, per, per feature. Okay, so this is, how, this is how the distribution of guessing probably definitely looks like for different images. So for some images, some parts may be not visible, so there may be some guessing. Uh, or maybe the, the image is not really very clear, it's blurry and so on, so th there is a lot of guessing. Whereas for some images, it is pretty clear, so there is not much guessing going on, but some part is not visible or um, maybe it's not very clear what, what you should assign to, what, what value you should assign to something, so uh, there, there can be some probably, probably as well. So there are about five annotators per image uh, attribute pair for mechanical Turk. And these are all uh, averaged and weighted with their certainty levels. Could you please explain exactly what a mechanical Turk is? Okay. <laughs> uh, a mechanical Turk is like a crowdsourcing engine where um, pe people log on to earn money, basically, per question that they answer. And experimenters uh, design experiments to ask simple questions to these mechanical Turk users to do various tasks 
such as annotating data. Okay? And per, per question that is answered by the mechanical Turk, they're required to pay the user. Okay. All right, so um, this is an especially interesting data set for us because there are uncertainty levels associated with the data and we can take that and you make use of that directly in the model because this is a Bayesian model, so we, we can deal with the uncertainty. Okay, so we first used uh, unsupervised tree to learn a whole taxonomy of images here. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry, um, we, we learned this tree of images uh, and I represent these caricatures here um, that, that show you only five attributes. Ex actually, there were 15 attributes taking different values, but to, be, to make it uh, able to display, I'm, I'm only showing five attributes here. I think these are like the overall color, belly color, uh, wing color, and so on. So you can see that the blue birds are clustered together and the red birds are clustered together. And uh, by the way, gray is the uncertain feature, so you're going to see uh, as things merge coalesce together, there will be more and more grays in the tree. Um, this part of the tree has yellow birds in it, and there are black birds, there's yellow bellied birds, and so on. So you can see that uh, in terms of getting a visual taxonomy, it's doing uh, quite a good job. And when you look at the um, images at the subtrees, uh, you can again see that there, there's quite a good clustering going on. So uh, this is the ancestor of all these images here. So uh, of course, to the algorithm, we give the mechanical Turk annotations, not, not the images themselves. We could have given the um, computer vision features as well, but we didn't do that yet. Okay, so you see that we do get a pretty good clustering and uh, the subtrees that we get do make sense. Okay. All right, so about using DNA morphology for differentiation clustering. So the previous task was to learn a visual taxonomy uh, to be able to do fast search, right? Um, and to have a hierarchical representation of the images. Here, what we want to do is we want to take an image of, the, of a germline. This is a C. elegans germline. Um, we want to pre-process it so that we, we get segmented images. Can we turn off this light, maybe? This one? So we, we get segmented cells. So now we have, we have information about each cell. We do feature extraction. Then we want to do clustering. Uh, we, we use hierarchical clustering only because uh, we don't have a, a lot of data points and we want to be able to get as much possible out of the data, uh, as much as possible out of the data. And after all, we're interested only on a set clustering, so what we'll do is we'll cut the tree somewhere uh, that gives us the set clustering that we're interested in. So um, I said we want to do hierarchical clustering, although we want a fat clustering in the end. One reason is because hierarchical clustering has more representative power. The other thing is we are not sure how many clusters we are looking for because, again, uh, we want to do something unsupervised, but we want to work with the biologists uh, on the other side and give them all we can uh, give them with the hierarchical clustering. The, basically what we, we do is we give them the tree and then tell them, okay, you can play around with the tree to see what the clustering looks like uh, in the germline and tell us what level of clustering you're satisfied with. So what we are after is some differentiation. So uh, as, as cells go through their lives, they differentiate into different uh, differentiation states. And the interesting question here is, by just looking at the DNA morphology, which are, which are the green things here, so by only looking at 
their morphology, the, the, their shape the, that they take along the cell cycle or the cell lifetime actually, uh, can, we, can we differentiate between different differentiation states? That's the scientific question here that the biologists are interested in. And whoop. Oh, you didn't see that. My <laughs> calendar just popped out something. Okay. <laughs> Um, so this is the ground truth. Basically, they have a marker called Gold One marker, which tells the differentiation state. So there are different brightness levels, and each brightness level roughly tells you a differentiation border. So you can see that this is really dark here. So there is one differentiation here. Th there, there is some reddish part here. So th there is another differentiation border, and then. This is bright. I think this part is empty. That's why it's reddish here. But uh, this is bright. So th all this is another differentiation. So these are the differentiation borders. And with the hierarchical clustering, uh, all the colors are from different clusters. So we can see that we can get roughly uh, the same differentiation borders. Um, although there's yellow here and yellow here, but then when we zoom into the clusters, we see that actually um, the yellow there was uh, a different, belonging to a different subtree. So we can, we can play around with the level that we cut the tree at to, to find the perfect clustering border. So this is like, a, this is using the coalescence, the hierarchical clustering as a exploratory data mining tool, let's say, or data analysis tool. So here the clustering obtained the, uh, successfully obtained the distinct uh, different cell cycle phases and differentiation states. Uh, we discovered a differentiation border using cell images. <coughs> and um, we, want to, we want to explore other things about this data, basically, whether the uh, features stay the same among different experimental conditions, whether we can apply to the wild type data as well uh, as the experimental data that we had here, um, which were genetically modified ground lines and so on. And uh, this will be extended to um, apply on more larger data sets. Okay, so. There, there, there are ways to like there are ways people use. For example, you can look at the separation between branch lengths. So if there is a subtree uh, with really little branch branch lengths, and then it is joining with a much lo longer length of branch, for example, then you can say this looks like a separate cluster to me. So people use that, for example, um, or you can do what you do in flat clustering, I guess. Say, I want this many clusters of nodes. OK, so I mentioned earlier that <coughs> I mentioned earlier that the existing algorithms in population genetics uh, don't work as well as the algorithms I explained here, simply because they're trying to mo model a much larger state space than what we do. And uh, I think that's that is what is causing the difference in performance. So in population genetics, what people want to do is uh, they want to actually uh, use a Monte Carlo sum to approximate the marginal likelihood. So uh, they have the data. They, they model the data given the, given the tree and the, the weight, uh, sorry, uh, the tree and the mutation parameter, the mutation rate, and uh, basically they, they sample different trees using the same type of algorithms, the sequential Monte Carlo algorithms, uh, and therefore there are weights associated with each of these trees. And now when you sum over these different samples with different weights, you get an estimate of the marginal likelihood. It's basically the probability of the data given the mutation rate. Okay. So they want to get this so that later they can plot the uh, curves like this. Uh, so the mutation rate 
and the marginal likelihood. And then they want to figure out which, which mutation rate is the most likely rate that produced the data that we observed. Okay, so this is one way of deciding what was the mutation rate for the population that we're studying here. So here I'm showing uh, some different algorithms, comparison of different algorithms. Uh, as I said, all these algorithms are sequential Monte Carlo algorithms and uh, they're theoretically supposed to give you the correct answer. So if you have enough samples, if you have enough terms in this sum, eventually you're going to get this correct uh, value for the marginal likelihood. But of course, we're, we cannot afford infinite samples, so we're, we're going to use finitely many samples and much smaller than what is actually necessary probably uh, for realistic data sets. So it's important to assess um, the quality of the samplers. So that was one question about um, what, is the, what is the efficiency of your sampler versus another sampler and so on. So this is one way of assessing the um, quality of the samplers. You, you estimate the curve using the same number of particles. Here it's 100. You estimate the curve multiple times. So this is an algorithm by Stephens and Donnelly. This is considered the state, <coughs> of, the, uh, state of the art in population genetics. So it's used uh, most widely, I think, uh, this and its variations. Um, the blue dotted lines are from Slatkin. He is also from population genetics. Uh, however, his algorithm is not used very uh, popularly. I'm not sure why. Um, but basically, th this is the algorithm that I uh, described in the very beginning. It's the one that is sampling times from the prior. Okay, And this is an algorithm by me and you, uh, the, the red curves. Uh, this is the algorithm that scales quadratically. Okay, so you see that they all have some variation. Ideally, they would be overlapping. So the black curves here are from all these different algorithms using, I think, 10,000 samples. So 10,000 samples is still manageable for this data set um, because it, it only had like 10 data points, I guess. Um, so when, when you have 10,000 samples, all these curves overlap. So that's good news. That means you, you actually do have a perfect representation of your posterior using 10,000 samples only. But the important question is who gets there first, right? Who, who has less variance with increasing number of particles? So when we increase the number of particles to 250, of course, <laughs> the good news is for us. So our algorithm uh, has less variance. <coughs> it's much tighter than the two alternatives that we compared to. And as we increase to 750, uh, the other algorithms start shrinking as well, and we increase and the other algorithms shrink as well. Uh, although surprisingly, Stephen Stanley, uh, well surprisingly because it is the most prominent algorithm used in population genetics, but not surprisingly when you look at the um, algorithmic details, uh, it has most variance when you have 5,000 samples and yeah, I guess this is, yeah, 10,000 samples. All right, so um, I guess I, I said all these before. So just as a sum up, I'll, I'll show you some computational comparisons. Um, this is the algorithm that scales quadratically, uh, and this is the algorithm that scales cubically, the second algorithm that I talked about, which uh, do, does not sample from the prior, but it samples from this integrated out uh, coalescent time proposal distribution. So the difference between these two is this uses a different proposal distribution, keeping the, um, the coalescent rate constant so that it can reuse computations. So again, this is quadratic, this is cubic, and one interesting thing is, although this is computationally more efficient, it's also uh, more efficient in terms of sampling size. So I'm showing here the likelihood or the marginal likelihood versus the number of particles. So as the number of particles increase, uh, the variance 
decreases. So the, the solid curve, the solid red, and this thick dotted um, black curve here are the means of the, of the likelihood, the marginal likelihood estimation. And these ones are the standard deviation. And so you can see that uh, the standard deviation shrinks much faster for SMC, whereas for post post uh, it, it gets there, but uh, the, the mean estimate is correct, but there's a lot more variance. And the effective sample size uh, of the algorithms, which is kind of equivalent to the mixing rate of uh, in MCMC, for those of you that are more familiar with MCMC. So the effective sample size of this quadratic algorithm is much better than that of post post. So this kind of shows that it, it's both, th this is both more efficient in terms of computation time and it is more efficient in terms of sampling quality. Okay, uh, so now a comparison of post post SMC1 and the, new, n the newer faster algorithm which I call nearest neighbor SMC, the one that uses the nearest neighbors to limit the computations to a subset of the sample so that it scales with n log n. So here, uh, this is CPU time versus the data set size. And the dotted lines are the theoretical, um, theoretical speeds of the algorithms, right? So uh, this is quadratic, this is cubic, and this is n log n. And uh, the, the solid lines are basically the empirical lines. So we can see that there's a good agreement between empirical and uh, theoretical run times. Uh, here there's a big deviation. That's because as we use larger data sets, um, we increase the uh, k as well. So we didn't keep it constant. So there was a k n log n um, <coughs> scaling. And that's why it's scaling where it looks like it's scaling worse than n log n, but there's, that's because there's that k factor there. Um, but I think the most important take home message from this slide is this is CPU time, this is the size of the data set. And um, so these two algorithms, for they, they ran uh, on the same amount of time for 375 data points. Uh, and whereas this, the, this guy took three, uh, uh, the same amount of time on 3,000 data points. So there is like an order of magnitude difference here. Okay, so comparing the log evidence scores that we get with SMCNN, the nearest neighbor SMC, and SMC1, the quadratic algorithm, uh, we can see that um, if we use, uh, and again, this is the CPU time spent by the algorithms, and this is log evidence. So the CPU time is basically proportional to the number of particles that you use. Uh, as you use more and more particles, you get better and better with the SMCNN, the new algorithm. Uh, if you use very little number of particles, then you can get really bad results. That was also, this is also related to the quality of samples question. So we, we know that we're going to get not very good uh, samples when we have only a few particles here with SMCNN because the proposal distribution is actually poor. We know that the proposal distribution is not of high quality. But we also know that we are capturing something about the data and we can easily get rid of the poor quality samples by pruning out them out by doing resampling. And that's what happens later on uh, when we include more and more data points. So interesting thing to note here is that black is SMC1, right? So the leftmost points, the leftmost black points for SMC1 are with one particle. So which means one good thing and one bad thing. The good thing about it is that it already gets a very good value with using only one particle, right? Uh, the, the quality of just one sample using SMC1 is incredibly good compared to s small number of particles of the other algorithm. 
But the bad news is that you cannot do any faster than this, right? You, you start off from two hours of CPU time for this data set, you cannot go any faster, right? So if you had 10 minutes, there is nothing you can do with using SMC1, whereas if you had 10 minutes, you could still do something, although not as well with the other algorithm. The reason is, I think the reason is because we don't have enough computation time to keep going on. So if we went on, then it would have probably increased. Plus, um, higher doesn't always necessarily mean better here. So uh, you remember from this slide? So these are higher, right? But actually this is a true value that you're after. But I'm showing this as a comparison and I'm claiming that SMCNN is doing better here because I'm pretty sure none of these algorithms have converged to something reasonable. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that we didn't get incredibly lucky here and shoot up the log evidence. So I'm, I'm pretty sure here that we're still underestimating the evidence uh, and SMCNN, if, if we could give it more samples, then it would have probably increased as well. Um, these are some sampling path curves. I think I'll skip over them. The uh, one important message here is that you can, you can look at these uh, sample paths and the reason why you see these uh, do going down and then jumping up, going down and jumping up is at these jumping up points there is resampling. So if if a um, if the weight of a particular particle starts decreasing, when you do resampling, you get rid of that. So you you take it back to wherever the other guy is. So uh, SMC one starts off pretty good, but then ends up in a very bad place. This is one drawback of SMC1, uh, which is because, you're, you, because you want to save some time doing computations, you, you need to move around things. So you don't take, like when you look at the details of the algorithm, you don't, you don't take into account everything you know about the particular uh, sample at current iteration. Um, but you, you basically delay including some of the information in the weights until later on in the algorithm in the name of saving computation time. This is why, uh, although it looks like it's doing much better, it ends up at a very bad position. So I have to admit that this is one drawback of SMC1. Okay, so one last thing, which is comparison of the greedy algorithm to all the other algorithms. I didn't talk much about the greedy algorithm simply because there are simple variations of the other algorithm. Uh, as I said, the greedy nearest neighbor algorithm uh, is a simple variation of the SMC nearest neighbor algorithm where you just get rid of the sampling steps, you make them deterministic, and that's your greedy algorithm. And similar is greedy rate one. So it is very similar to SMC one, the uh, N squared algorithm. You get rid of the stochastic part and you have the greedy algorithm. So comparing the uh, log joint probabilities of the different algorithms and the CPU time it's, it, they, they take. So the greedy rate one and greedy nearest neighbor on this data set, oh, sorry I forgot to put the label for this data. I think this is the BIRDS data. They're kind of around the same order of magnitude. Uh, for the other data set, it was actually greedy nearest neighbors that did better uh, than greedy rate one, but I didn't include those results here. Um, so one interesting thing is greedy nearest neighbors uh, can beat the performance of sequential al algorithms when the number of particles used is less than some number, which is going to be data set dependent. So when there are not enough particles, then you may be better off using greedy algorithms. 
this is something very sad for a Bayesian to admit because we all want the SMT algorithms to converge and to give us everything about the posterior distribution and so on, but we have to admit that you may be better off the using greedy algorithms when you don't have enough computational resources. But again, for Bayesians, the good news is that when you have enough resources, when you increase the number of resources that you use, when you increase the uh, amount of CPU time that you spend, you can actually get much better. So if you want to <coughs> get a better uh, idea about the posterior distribution, and if you want the map, for example, uh, a better es estimate of the map than the greedy, or I don't know, if you want to do something with the posterior, you don't have to be all morning because greedy algorithm beats the SMT algorithm. It's not always true. If you have enough computation time, then SMT algorithm can do better. Of course, this is the time it takes. So it takes quite some, <laughs> it takes like 100 times more <laughs> than the greedy algorithm. Okay, I think I'll finish here. Um, these are some more details, but yeah, I'll tell you that. Thank you.